with the strike of a light bulb. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. Your micro, I'm hard body like Tycho. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the papers of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst of pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. All right, welcome back to Developer Commentary. My name is Mike Stout. And I am Tony Garcia. And uh, uh, we're starting here pointed away from the arenas because we've we've already done, uh, what, like 300 arena episodes? Yeah, so, far too many. Yeah, so we're, we're going to move on. But before we did, I had something I wanted to mention about the galactic map, Tony. Let's hear about this galactic map, Mike. All I'm right. excited. This is just a little thing. But since we've gotten a big response out of little things, I might as well talk about this. One of the really difficult things when we made this game uh, for Ratchet 1 and Ratchet 2 was getting kids to know where they were supposed to go next, right? Or, or right. just getting any players to know where they were supposed to go next. They were getting lost constantly. Uh, you know, they, they, they may have had to do three missions on one planet, but they would only have done two, and they won't know what planet to go back to. It was a nightmare. Right. And we were always trying to fix that with the missions menu. But for this game, what we did was we, we, we have it linked up in the background to the, the missions so that whatever your top priority mission is and whatever planet that is, is automatically highlighted when you enter the galactic map. And that I just noticed as we were coming in here because now it's pointing us to our next planet, Obani Gemini. Excellent. And I would have had no idea that that's where we were going. So that's good. It's helping us because, you know, we, we're not playing these all in order necessarily. We're, there's sometimes five weeks that'll go between when we play them. So, uh -huh. so this, this feature saved me a bunch of time, and it was my idea. Excellent. Take that, Tony. So now people just jump into the, sk into the ship and just start mashing X. And then that method will take them to wherever they got to go. It'll take them through the whole game, including all the optional content. So, on a, sc on a scale of 1 to 10, how utterly useless is that mission screen in terms of actually having players figure out what the hell they're supposed to do? Well, Because I don't think pe most people even know this exists. In the, in the user test, we'd see people use it a lot. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, what, what would happen is they would get lost. They'd run around for about five or ten minutes. Then they'd start playing with the... Now, this was older kids. Uh, like, the ten-year-olds and under usually wouldn't do this as much. But the older kids would come in and start messing around with the menu. And we put missions up first. So you'd just go in there. And then in this game, since uh, it's all sorted... Like, we always sorted them based on what you... Like, the ones you have done are uh, are gone, and the ones you haven't done are, are up first, right? So uh -huh. you could come in here and see what you had to do. But by by linking it up with the ship, now we made it so that no matter what, if the kid gets in and mashes buttons, they'll get where they need to go. Right. So it's not as useless as it would seem, uh, mainly because I think when people are desperate, they go to the, the pause menu, you know? Gotcha. So we're back on a spherical world. Oh, joy, spherical worlds. Uh, spherical th world refractor puzzle. This this particular spherical world refractor puzzle was me. Uh, and I, I think it was also me, but I could be wrong. I, I remember you doing all the enemy work in this level. Yeah. Uh, you this was my first experience trying to code up enemy AI on spherical worlds. And you had to you had to make these, these dudes from Ratchet 1... Yep, uh, had to work, bring them back. Bring them back to life. And work spherically. And work spherically. How much of a pain in the ass was that, Tony? It's a huge pain in the ass, Mike. Why is and it a huge pain in the ass? You know why it's a huge pain in the ass? Because something that you did on the very first encounter with the enemy happens all the fucking time. What? In that you swung the wrench at the guy, and he was right in front of you, and you <laughs> missed. Why Why couldn't you just extend his collision down? What, 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 uh, what? What happened? Well, you can't have their collision be any lower because then it screws up with their pathing. Oh. Their ability to walk around on the environment. Okay. 
because it's a very hilly environment and if it, if that collision comes down too far into the ground and they're constantly clipping into the ground and there's a whole there's a whole thing there's a whole lot going on but Ma makes sense it's oh it happened again i know it's gonna keep happening because <laughs> those guys are really small But you had to make them flying, guys, because you didn't want guys with feet. Oh, we have guys with feet on the later level. On the Courtney Gears level, I think we have guys with feet. Really? Because that seems so. like a nightmare. How do you? It's, how did you get foot locking on a sphere? Uh, I didn't get really too much foot locking on the sphere. Uh, the fact is that the, the work I did on the Magnet Boot stuff in the last game helped immensely in terms of getting these guys to work properly on spherical worlds. Uh, uh, oh, right, like the, the guys running down the side of the building and all that. Yeah, exactly. The fact that I had already sort of tackled that problem before on the Magna Boots made the spherical worlds a little bit better because I had it... I did have a way to... Uh, I had already figured out the problem of getting them to align to the surface smoothly and make sure there weren't any insane pops and... You know, made sure it worked. It worked pretty well, because uh, I think uh, well, a lot of the stuff that we had had just sort of, and this is one of the big challenges that came with spherical worlds in general, is that we had for a long time uh, hard coded what the up vector for gravity was. <laughs> Anytime you want to do movement, you have to determine what direction is forward. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to move forward, you have to know sort of what direction that is to go. Right. And, and that, we, that would be your forward vector, right? Right. Exactly. And uh, one of the easiest ways to, to calculate sort of your orientation is that you take the cross product of two of the vectors and that gives you the third vector. So if you need to get the if you need to get the side vector, and this is how you orient characters uh, in a in a matrix, you need their forward vector, you need their up vector, and you need the side vector. Okay. And uh, if you know the forward vector, which you n pretty much always do, uh, and you know the up vector, which is hard coded in our game, which is Z up, it's incredibly easy to find the side vector, and that means it's incredibly easy to orient the character. Right, so you could take a lot of shortcuts and uh, you know get the same results when you're on flat ground. Right, in calculating the matrix, and it's a lot more speedy, and it's it's, it's basically better performance. Right, when you know when you have a hard coded up vector. And we need we need to be running this game at sixty frames per second and really good looking, right? So right, performance is everything. But uh, on the spherical worlds, we do not have a hard coded up vector. So what's so, the up vector then? Well, the up vector is from the center of the planet to ratchet. Oh, okay. Is the up vector. So you have to calculate it pretty much every frame. Pretty much every frame. We have, to, and that, I mean, it goes for the, it goes also for the enemies. They have to determine their rotation, their uh, position and orientation, all the time based on where they are in, rel in, you know, on the planet. So you don't really have anything you can take for granted. You have to do a, a ton of work. Well, you, I mean. The, Constantly having to orient them correctly to the ground is a bit of a problem. But like I said, I had done a lot of work on making sure that that worked for the magnet boot surfaces. So you were able to Because the magnet boot surfaces had the same problem. That the only way to determine that up vector was basically finding the normal of the ground and, you know, casting up. Uh -huh. But this is actually way cheaper than finding the normal of the ground. Because the normal of the ground required to do a collision cast. And this, I don't have to do a collision cast. I just know where the center of the world is. I know where I am. I know the up vector. And collision collision casts are really expensive, right? So expensive. <laughs> Unbelievably expensive. You do not want to do collision casts all the time. You can help it. Yeah, certainly not every frame. Uh, like and, and especially on like 20 guys. Yeah, you'll, br you'll bring the PlayStation to its knees 
But I think that's one of the main reasons why we have these uh, these levels are so sparse with enemy setups. Because a lot of that stuff that you take for granted, that's just sort of petition, position orientation calculations, are a lot more expensive on spherical worlds. And uh, exactly. that's just like the way it is. The frame rate just broke when I, both the, when I broke those crates. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Just broke again. Man, I, so, someone who was in charge of frame rate didn't do their job. Yeah, who would that be? Uh, I don't know. It, it couldn't possibly... Yeah, it was me. But, I mean, it's the same problem with the bolts, right? We have to calculate their orientation and position every frame to figure out where they're going to go. And uh, the thing is, like... Uh, the bolts when it's, on this level are sp special spherical world bolts, yeah. Yeah, everything is a special special one-off spherical world case. The crates, the bolts, the breakables, everything. I mean, you don't realize how many shortcuts you can actually take uh, for the most part. Like, getting to Ratchet on a normal level is just as simple as a straight line. Just finding out where he is and being like, I gotta go that way. But on Spherical Worlds, he might be over this ridiculous edge. You can't just say my forward vector is going to be exactly towards Ratchet, because that's not what your forward vector is going to be. Not at all. And Right, uh, you have to go up and over the ridge to get to Ratchet. You can't just go through the planet. And then to make matters worse, uh, all of this stuff has to be placed by hand in Maya. So, so like... That's why a lot of crates are That projectile is a good example of that projectile didn't follow the curvature of the earth and yes. it goes up over your head. And we can't have that happen a lot. Right. Like it works for those guys because projectile combat on a spherical world is hard enough on its own. To have that shit track on the surface of the planet would be I think maddening. I'm not sure if we did it or not, but I think we realized very quickly that it's very easy for them to shoot from over the horizon, and you're just like, what the fuck happened? Where are these things coming from? Oh, yeah. Didn't they track for a while and you actually had to disable that? I think so, yes. Yeah, I, I kind of remember that. Oh, man. All right. Rockets. Woo! Yeah, thank God for the rockets, man. So yeah, not everything tracks along the ground because some of it is actually cheap as hell and not very fun. And things like the uh, the crates, they uh, now we were using a special spherical crate, but they didn't do any correction to try to sit themselves on the ground or anything. Uh, every crate that I placed, I had to individually rotate to be as close to the following the ground as I could. I thought we fixed that. No. No, it was maddening, dude. Like, I, I, oh, man. I feel like it... Maybe in Deadlocked or something. I feel like we eventually got around to that problem. Oh, crap. Because I seem to recall a conversation... And I may be just be imagining this. Because I remember I was told that the crates didn't orient themselves to the ground mm -hmm. properly. And when somebody told me that... My my mind was blown because it was such an easy problem to solve. Really? How is, uh, how is it easy when everything else is hard? Well, because they're stationary. Okay. And their position doesn't change. So you solve it on the first frame. You solve it on the first frame and you fix it and then you're done. Right? Nobody cares if the game is out of frame on the first frame. Yeah. Because nobody will notice. Yeah. It's just a black screen. Right. So you do it all on, an, on the initialization. And then the problem is solved. So I kind of feel like that got solved eventually, but I may be wrong. Maybe, uh, maybe it it was made better, but there's still like a ton of crates that that aren't rotated right in this one. And I remember uh, having to rotate each crate individually, and then use a macro to move them up exactly one meter. <laughs> so it was. Uh, it was a huge pain in the ass to place the crates, the enemies, everything. Uh, I remember it was possible to, you know, those flying guys, if I didn't orient them right to start with, they would end up flying sideways with their, their butts <laughs> pointing to the right. Uh, and, like, there were a ton of bugs that I had to fix that just went like that. What the hell? I think you got a refractor that, right? Or am I 
Or am I missing? There's no. Well, laser. eventually, I think you got it. Well, I don't even know. Oh, maybe that's a secret. Uh, oh, speaking of the refractor on the spherical world, I didn't really talk about this while we were doing it, but one of the things I really like about how that design turned out was that uh, the laser is always pointing you where you need to go. So whenever you get lost in that level, which I did three or four times while I was playing, you can just look up and see where the laser ends and then walk towards it. That's not bad. Yeah, it worked out really well. I don't remember whether I did that on purpose or not, but when I realized it happened, I felt fucking awesome. <laughs> I was like, yeah, dude, I'm a designer. I know we talked about this on the on the last episode, but I think it bears repeating. I really like the, the map that we have for this real cool. Yeah. And I love that once you find a place to go on the map, it traces you a line back to where you started. Yeah. Oh man, that is so helpful. Because uh, it's really easy to get lost in a spherical world. For sure. Mm, giant robot torsos. I think, and I don't know if other people would have caught that, but I saw it there. His breakable spawned on, at the wrong orientation <laughs> on that giant robot torso. You know what? I'll go back and I'll play that real slow. Which means I'm willing to bet that breakables had a hard-coded Z up. And since he wasn't facing up, the breakable spawned at a 90-degree angle to what his actual up was. Oh, the crates did. Look. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. That's funny. I wonder if some some of the like the environment breakables were 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 coded correctly because they were special case. Yeah. But then like, the for the torso, he was in a lot of levels. So, why would he be? Uh, what the hell am I doing? Well, we had a very generic spawning oh. uh, break armor function, and uh, the armor was also was done in a very very specific way. It had to be right. set up in a very specific way. I kind of so remember a, that. Yeah. So we had a a very special case thing that spawned armor off of off of characters, and I would not be surprised if because and that was very deep in the engine. So I wouldn't be surprised if that stuff wasn't changed to account for spherical worlds. Yeah, I mean, everything you, used you change that and it breaks spawning. everything. That's, yeah. Who would want to do that? Well, it makes everything in the game more expensive, unnecessarily. Yeah. I think we might be at the end of the Obani moons. Like, we got to go to Hollow Star Studios and come back. Oh, okay. That's Giant Clank, right? Yeah, that's that's one of my segments. The Terror of Talos. <laughs> but it, there's also a Ratchet segment on it. Like, you switch back and forth, I think. Yeah, that, that'll be fun, man. I'm looking forward to talking about that one. Uh, I made more people mad with that design than I think anybody I've ever made mad in my entire life. Really? Yeah. I, I uh, And I rem there was an awkward meeting where I ended up screaming at the artist. Yeah, like th there's going to be good stories for that episode. What? How was it so divisive? This, uh, this meeting was so legendary that Brian Algeyer used it in a GDC speech as an example. Of what not to do? Uh, yeah, of how shit can go wrong really fast. <laughs> yeah, he... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to telling that story, but it's going to make me look like kind of an asshole. And I'm okay with that, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. So, for Ratchet & Clank Developer Commentary, I'm Mike Stout. And I'm Tony Garcia. And we'll catch you next time uh, when we... When we finally get to tell all those stories we just teased. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's good. We did that in under half an hour.